okay so good morning guys so welcome back uh, so today we are starting the day 2 session on uh, on our advanced linux so today's session is day 2 day 2 session day 2 and the timing is 8 10 am ist so day 2 session 1 i will give okay fine now so yesterday uh, we discussed something on operating system okay what uh, why exactly we need, we need an operating system right because whenever we are communicating from the user or uh, to the uh, hardware or from an application to the hardware you cannot directly communicate with it there has to be an interface and that interface is nothing but your is nothing but your operating system so operating system is but it's a set of programs or it's a set of models that controls and coordinate the hardware resources because each and every user or each and every application it needs some kind of a resources to be uh, to be started it means it needs some kind of resource to start without the hardware resources any application or the user they cannot exist or they cannot communicate uh, they cannot work at all there has to be some kind of a hardware resources to be provided so who is going to provide all the all, all those hardware resources the operating system okay and we have various different types of operating system also we have uh, like we have a windows operating system linux operating system mac operating system but if you uh, if you ask me uh, like uh, what are the different types of and we also understood that uh, there is something is a kernel we say so kernel is a main core of an operating system we learned right kernel is a main core of a operating system main core of the operating system or main heart of the operating system 90% of the job of the operating system is done by the kernel only 90% of the job of the operating system is done by the kernel only it is done by the kernel sorry is done by the kernel hence we say kernel is a non detachable part of an operating system it's a non detachable part of an operating system and uh, guys like if you see it there are different types of kernels which were evolved actually i i said i didn't discuss or i said i i didn't told about this but uh, i mean this is just for information monothical kernel you know like we have a micro kernel you know like we have a mm, Uh, exo kernel exo exo kernel okay we have a pico kernel there are n number of different types of kernel also exist but if you ask me uh, sir what how how you do categorize the kernel okay into main which are the two main categories of the kernel we would say that monolithic kernel uh, we will say that all the kernels are broadly categorized into two categories one is a monolithic kernel and other is a micro kernel your linux or your unix it is a pakka monolithic kernel pakka monolithic kernel I mean your linux or unix is a monolithic kernel even today also uh, you know like uh, whatever the linux kernel we are getting it is a monolithic kernel monolithic kernel and a few more examples like uh, if you see the traditional unix right unix uh, sorry windows 98 windows 98 was also earlier or the the windows which was you know released in windows uh, in the year 98 98 right even that was also a monolithic kernel micro kernel all most of the recent uh, you know like uh, windows operating system right like for example your windows 10 windows 11 uh, windows 10 windows 11 or else your windows xp windows vista some of you might have used this windows vista and windows xp right i was using this windows xp a lot so these are all micro kernels and uh, okay so i could define this what is it actually but it will be a too much of discussion for us so what you can do like you can understand by googling out what exactly a monolithic kernel is monolithic kernel so what do you mean monolithic monolithic means what can anyone tell me the meaning of monolithic Yes. Can monolithic is an entire application that is run run in one particular. Uh, hmm. 
it has everything into one, one type of film where yes yes correct it is it has everything bits and pieces yes yes it has everything actually it is monolithic actually in a greek term monolithic means it's a single stone we say monolithic means it's a single stone single stone you know like uh, in uh, in karnataka or in bangalore if you go to a place by name shravana belagola you will get a very big uh, dt of uh, uh, lord mahavir mahavir they say that the whole uh, the dt right which was carved by this uh, sculptures right it is been carved with a single uh, stone they say so this is the place actually and if you see it actually and uh, this is the great uh, you know like uh, uh, you know like uh, the dt of lord mahavir so this uh, dt right it was carved in a single stone they say actually okay so monolithic means it is for a single architecture monolithic monolithic current means means it means that all the hardware dependent features plus all the hardware independent features everything together will be loaded during boot up time in case of a monolithic so uh, in monolithic what i'm saying what i said that all the hardware independent features independent features plus all the hardware dependent features everything will be everything will be loaded during boot up time in case of monolithic that's how we say actually good something okay we need to really in, uh, get into in detail i'm just saying whereas in a micro kernel all the hardware dependent features plus only some of the hardware independent features some of the hardware not all some of the hardware independent features will be loaded during boot up time in case of micro kernel okay that's all i can say at this point of time if somebody needs more information you please let me know i will going to add many more but this is sufficient so there are make different types of kernels are there okay so yeah i mean this is okay but not we need not to really worry about much about this but we have different types of kernel also and our linux or unix will fall under multiple category there are many kind of other operating system also are there like re real time operating system or re real time mucos ecos qnx operating system right all your embedded operating system real time operating system you know like uh, if you launch a rocket right you know the, recently like we launched the chandrayaan uh, rocket right like the rocket right basically what happened all the real time act, uh, real time operating systems are all micro kernels actually so whatever the kernel which they have designed for launching right for uh, accepting the commands and doing everything is a micro kernel micro kernel are very very faster kernel this is and they take it the command uh, whatever we execute the command they take it instantly and they process the command so whatever you see right micro kernel the embedded linux or the qnx mucos ecos rtl linux means some of you might have heard or not i don't know i uh, right there is a kernel by name rtl linux actually rtl linux is a real time uh, kernel actually and this real time kernel rtl linux falls under your micro kernel category see it permits installation of very low latency interrupt handlers of there are so many things are there introduction to the real time operating system so guys this is a very very uh, you know like uh, complex things to learn but we are not uh, we are not learning all these things okay so only the developers will learn all these things who are on all in embedded systems who are all in uh, writing lot of device drivers who are into microcontroller programmers those guys will write all this or those guys understand these things okay good now yesterday uh, yeah yes yes bhai bhav atos correct yes bhai bhav atos yeah so now <clears throat> now yesterday if you have seen the diagram or yesterday if you recall it uh, we have a ram memory we say a ram memory is not but the primary memory it's a primary memory ram memory so during boot up time the system will divide this whole ram memory into two spaces that also we discussed user space and kernel space very good it's a user space and the kernel space
Now, during boot up time, as I said, right, you are bootloader, the grub bootloader. That is a default bootloader which is used in Linux, actually. The grub bootloader, what it does, it loads a compressed image of an operating system into your into your kernel space of the RAM memory. And during the boot phases, what happened? The whole operating system will get uncompressed. So many initialization happens. So many hardware will get initialized. A lot of internal functions are getting executed. Finally, an operating system will be up and running. It means that the whole operating system will be up and running. And this is nothing but your Linux kernel, which will be up and running, correct? This is nothing but your Linux kernel. It will be up and running. So as soon as your Linux kernel will come up, up and running, what happened? Your system will come to a stable state. And it will show you a prompt where a user can log into the system. So here what happened? In our case, we are logging into the system with some user account, right? For example, in our case, uh, suppose you are having uh, Kiran. Kiran will log in it. Yesterday I took this name, Kiran. Kiran is able to log in. How Kiran able, able to log in it? Because he will get some kind of a terminal. He will get some kind of a terminal. Or through some external software, he can able to log into the system. How he can able to log in system? Oh, he will say, sir, I know the IP address of the system. Okay, very good. He knows the IP address of the system. Very good. He has the username and he has a password. Either he can use the username and the password or either he can use the username and the key. Right? The key he can use. So any one method he would use and he will try to log into this machine. As soon as you log into the machine, he is an authenticator user. He has the right to make use of the resources which is provided by the system. And this user will always interact with the kernel or communicate with the kernel. This is what we discussed yesterday. And this user, Kiran, he can run any command. He can run any application, right? He can do any kind of a stuff. Whatever the permission is provided for him, he can do all the stuff. Whenever he executes any term in, uh, sorry, any commands or any application, right? Always he interacts with the kernel. Yes, this is what we discussed yesterday. Clear, sir? Any doubts here? Guys, I want to know. Is it clear for you? So if you have any kind of a doubt, just let me know because now we are going to understand many more things. So I would, uh, uh, I expect that you understand at least these things. Okay. Okay, fine. Good. So now, so now what happened, right? Uh, uh, okay. So you have a user and you have a kernel or you have a process or sorry, you have a user and the kernel where the kernel, uh, sorry, where the user interact with the kernel actually. Now, so the question might come, sir, how I can actually interact with the kernel, sir? What are the different ways a user can interact with the kernel? Yes, there are four to five ways are there where any user space uh, process can communicate with the kernel. What are those methods? First is a command, sir. Yes, I. whenever I have a command, I can execute that command and I can interact with the kernel. Like for example, okay. I'll come back to here, guys. Let me do one thing first. Let me log into my systems, actually. Uh, yesterday, what happened, right? I stopped both this instance. So before I before we started the class, right, I just made this instance up and running again, OK? So these are the two servers which are up and running. And if you go to the download, where I have downloaded the putty gen and the putty, yesterday we discussed about this. If you still have any doubts, please let me know. Okay, now what happened through a putty software? This is a third party software. Through the putty software, I'm trying to log into some server actually. Basically, I'm trying to log into some uh, Linux server, right? So when I launch the putty, you will get, you will, it will open, the, it will launch this putty configuration actually. Here, what happened that you need to provide the host name or the IP address and through which uh, uh, connection type I'm doing. I'm basically, I'm doing an SSH connected type. SSH connection type. SSH is not but secure shell. So this is one of the way uh, SSH is one of the protocol through which uh, you can actually come, you can actually connect to any Linux machine actually. So we will discuss more about this in our upcoming session on what is an SSH is all about, okay? How internally SSH works, right? Uh, and uh, what are fingerprints, uh, then what is an authentication types, uh, and how to make a passwordless communication between two servers using SSH. Uh, there are many things other which we'll be doing, and uh, and we do a lot of automation uh, in our day-to-day uh, -day activity uh, with the help of uh, with for this SSH actually. Because as a DevOps engineer, you know, like from one server to you need to connect to many other server. You cannot always give user and the password to connect from one machine to another machine. 
it should always be a passwordless communication because if I'm sitting in a machine A, if I want to log into the machine B, machine C, or machine D, I should flawlessly log in into these servers without asking any password. So through the SSH protocol, how I can achieve a passwordless authentication that we'll be discussing in the upcoming sessions. So now what happened, we have a UTI and we have to give either host name or the IP address. You have to give the machine name or the IP address. So basically whenever you want to, uh, you know, like connect to any external machine or any external Linux machine, always you have to provide the public IP address, right? If you go here and you could see that if I click onto this you CentOS, and you could see that it is showing me this, this is the public IP. And this is nothing but your public IP for DNS, complete DNS name actually. So either you can give this public IP for DNS or you can just give a plain IP for this. Okay. So because this is in an external, uh, because this is in a cloud environment, right? So, and we are accessing through the internet, actually, you cannot use a private IP. Private IP is not possible. If your system is there within your local network, right? Then you can access that server using the private IP. Since these servers are not in a private, uh, in the private network, it is in a, it is in a internet. So you need to always have a public IP. So public IP is the one which you have to give it. Now, if I copy this public IP and if I give it to here in, I have to just, I have to just. Uh, it. Sir, one question is there. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, in a uh, real time environment, we uh, create the uh, compute instances using private IP only. There are no public IP present. So in that case, uh, how things happen? Oh, yeah. Because, uh, this is in the in your local network, sir. Suppose, for example, you are working in a Wipro company. Okay. okay. Right. You are you are sitting in a Wipro. Uh, you are sitting in your Wipro office. You know, like uh, you are having a Wipro office even in US also. Yes, sir. Even there also a lot of servers are there, right? Yes. So what happened? Right? Whenever you want to connect it, first you need to uh, you need to be in your uh, uh, Wipro network actually. Yes. Sir. If you are in Wipro network, what happened that you can easily connect from your from your Wipro network network to the Wipro networks office building, which is there in US actually. Even though those servers are in a private IPs. Okay. Okay. Because what happened, right? Internally, when you are connecting it, actually, you are into the same network actually. So how the connection happens with because with the help of a VPN, it happens. Yes, yes, yes. Got it, got it. Yeah. So we will discuss about that also later after some time. Okay, that's a good question. So here, what I'm doing that, I know that this is a CentOS machine uh, and I need to always log in it. Always make sure that you always create some kind of a session where you can, uh, you know, like where you can quickly log in. You know to do again and again always. So you could see that actually that, uh, let me create some session. Like for example, here, this is a CentOS machine and I know uh, that you need to log in with the CentOS user itself. So what I will do, I will use a username by name CentOS at the rate. I'll give this like this. CentOS at the rate. Good. So I'll copy this and I will give it here also sent out service. And uh, then what happened, right? Uh, then I have to set some settings here because uh, every time when I set, right, uh, some kind of a default setting should be there. So for doing that, what I will do, I'll go to the terminal. I'll see if there is anything which I have to check. No keyboard, nothing, bell or none because I don't need the bell to be, uh, no, I have to disable the bell. Features, is there anything which I have to do? No, sir. Windows, nothing. Appearance, okay, I can go to the change and I can give something 14 or whatever bold, okay, and say, I can say, okay. And then like, what about the translation? Nothing, okay, color, okay, let me do a default foreground setting. And if I go to the connection, so seconds between repeated. If you give 300 seconds, you're making your session live for a very long time. Suppose you are not doing any activity on your session for around one hour still that session will not be closed, right? It will be open only. So I need that feature. So that's what you have to always give the uh, second between, uh, no, keep alive is 300 something. And then like here, you come over here uh, in your uh, connection and here you go to the auth and you go to the credentials, uh, browse it and give your centos.ppk and say open. So once you have did uh, some kind of a preliminary settings, again, go back to the session. Now you have did all kind of a setting to it. Now what you have to do, you have to just save it. See, can you see here that the session has been saved. Can we do the same thing for Ubuntu? Because in when you log into the Ubuntu server, 
you should always uh, like uh, have some you shouldn't always uh, you know uh, do all the settings every time you can create a session a saved session here use a session and to log into the server okay let us do for the ubuntu also so i will always say ubuntu at the rate right same thing ubuntu at the rate like this okay again for the ubuntu i have to do the same thing so login in nothing nothing here terminal nothing keyboard yeah i don't have anything it's let this be a default setting uh bell uh none it's already there fine appearance okay let me do the change 14 bold everything is fine and then appearance what about the color okay for this also let me do a, a default uh background foreground sorry and then in the connection oh it's already there 300 okay and in the auth right credential browse it give the ubuntu.pck file and open and it's open go back here out of the session yes now you save this session see you would have this saved. so now next time when you try to open your putty again you could see that these two sessions or these two saved sessions are there now what i have to do go here centos os copy the public ip come over here in the putty just do uh, click on this and just say load and give here ip copy paste this public ip and you could see that you're using SSH connection type and always SSH works under the port number 22, always. So this should always be there. And then you open it. Now you could see that it will always log in like this. So you need not to do any settings. So it's a one-time activity. Always, whenever you're working on mini servers, please try to create a lot of, a lot of sessions like this actually. Save session like so that it will, the life become very easy. See, for example, if I, Try to exit. If I try to exit AXIT, exit, I'm going to kill the terminal. See, again, come over here. Again, copy this public IP of CentOS server. You have already launched. Click on this, load it, and give this IP and open it. See, it becomes so easy. So we need this, uh, you know, we need to have always have the save session like this. Is it clear, guys? Similarly, for your Ubuntu here. Click on this, copy the public IP, go to your putty, launch the putty, Ubuntu, load, and give this public IP. Yes, open it. Yeah, accept it. Accept the connection. You are able to log in. Clear? So, guys, any doubts you have, you have here? Or should I repeat it? Uh, Rajesh, I have a small load. Hmm. Uh, yesterday you uh, copied the public key to the host from the ansible mm -hmm. using ssh copy if and id mm -hmm. uh, but you in the ssh configuration file you made uh, changes to the host based authentication yes right hello host based authentication yes yeah uh, uh -huh. uh -huh. correct but uh, we have ssh key based authentication uh, when we are using uh, this too See, always, sir, when you go to the industry, right, you know, nowadays, nowadays, we are not given any kind of a passwords. Always authentication happens through the key only. SSH key. Yes, SSH key only. Yeah. We never use any kind of passwords are disabled, actually, by the administrator. Uh, when we have to use host-based authentication and when we have to use SSH uh, key-based authentication. That part. Uh, yeah. Sir, if I answer this question later, is it fine? It's yeah, a good question, sense. but we will we will do it actually. Don't worry, because uh, we will deviate from the topic actually. <laughs> okay, sir. No, sure. thank, you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good question. I'll address your question. Don't worry. Others we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll discuss in our uh, no breaks actually. Yeah, sure, sir. Okay, fine. Now. Okay. Okay. So we did it. Now, see now. Now you could see that. When I log into this server, guys, when I log into the server, I use a putty session, actually. I use this putty session. Putty is an external uh, software, as I said, and uh, it's a third-party software through which you are logging to some machine, remote machine, right? By providing some details and you're able to log in it, actually. As soon as you log in it, actually, right? You are, you are, you, as soon as you log in, you could see that you have got this, some, this kind of, this terminal actually got. And you could see that there is something that's blinking. Oh, it means that you can give some kind of an inputs here. So as soon as you get this prompt, this we call it is a primary prompt. As soon as you log in, you'll get a prompt. This primary prompt is not what we call this as a shell prompt. We call this as a 
shell call. Because guys, here CentOS has logged into it. Actually, CentOS is a normal user. So if you understand through this diagram, CentOS also has logged in here with the, some username by name CentOS. CentOS also has logged in. Okay. Similarly, if you come here, even Ubuntu also has logged in. Okay. So Ubuntu is a Ubuntu is a normal user, sir. Yes, Ubuntu is a normal. Even he has logged in. Good. So as soon as any user logs in, he will get some kind of a terminal. He will get some kind of a terminal. Now, for example, yesterday you saw that when I logged in it, I executed one command, the TTY command. <clears throat> TTY command will tell you about the information about that what is your terminal name or the what is your terminal number, like that. So here what happened, right? A user will get some kind of a terminal name. Like when Kiran logs in, Kiran might get some terminal. Like for example, what kind of a terminal Kiran might get it? He might get a terminal with some name known as a slash there slash tty1. Okay, good. When the centers has logged in, he has got the terminal some slash pts slash zero. Okay, good. When Ubuntu has logged in, slash he also getting the same. So guys, whenever any user logs in, he will get some some, some terminal. And each and every terminal, we have it has some terminal name. And how you can display the terminal name? By executing the TTY command, right? So, but now the question comes, Rajesh, is it why we need this information? What is the use of it? Yes, sir, definitely we need this information because that you are interacting with the system with help of some terminal. I need to even know some terminals name. I need to know what is the terminal on which I'm working because all the things, whatever you're working, everything you are working within the terminal only. Whenever you exit from the terminal, you are losing the terminal. When I say exit command, and if I say exit and say enter, you're logging out from the terminal. So guys, whenever I log into the system, I get a terminal, good. And also I get a shell also. So this one, whatever you're seeing here, whatever you're seeing here, this is nothing but your shell. This is not what a shell. So for every terminal, a shell is attached. Like that you have to understand. Okay, good. So it means that Rajesh, for every terminal is a ter terminal is, for every terminal is any shell is attached. Yes, sir. The shell is attached. With this, a shell is attached like this. Beautiful. Okay. So it means that it means that uh, does Rajesh that you, this user Kiran is actually sitting on top of a shell and working? Yes, sir. On the top of a shell, he's sitting and working. Does the CentOS is sitting on the top of a shell and working? Yes, he's sitting on the top of a shell and working. Does the Ubuntu is sitting on the top of the shell and working? Oh, it means that Rajesh, when I log into any machine, I will get a shell itself, right? Yes, I will get a shell. How are you going to share, get the shell? With the help of a terminal. Is it clear, sir? Um, sir, is it, uh, is it fine with everyone? Are you yes, finding sir. interesting? Yes, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good. Very good. So now what happened, right? Whenever any user logs in, so he will get a terminal. And that terminal is nothing but it's a shell. That is how you have to understand. Okay, beautiful. Sir, now what happened? I'm sitting in a terminal or I'm sitting in a shell. I'm exuding many commands. Like, for example, I exuted a TTY command. That's good. Yes, very good. LS command. Good. Date command. Good. Who am I command? PWD command. If config command. See, you are executing so many commands. So command is one of the way where the communication happens between a user and the kernel. Are the operating system to such? Okay. First method is a command. So uh, Rajesh, you said earlier that there are four, five methods are there to communicate the command, uh, to communicate from the user to the kernel. Yes. The first method is always a command. So you are executing every command, everything with the help of a shell action. So without a shell, a user cannot communicate with the kernel. Their shell has to be there. Right? So that is the first method, is a command. What is the second method for communicating? System calls. Yesterday we discussed something on that system calls. The third method is not but the proc file system. The fourth method is not but the uh, 
IOCTLs. IOCTLs. We need not to worry all these things, right? And the fifth method is the SIS file system. So these are some of the ways, by using this any one of the way, a communication can be made from the user to the kernel. So commands, system calls, proc file system, IOCTL, sys file system. Okay, beautiful. So now yesterday, you remember, if you remember yesterday, uh, you know, like I was showing that, oh, uh, guys, when I'm executing ls command, it is getting executed. When I'm executing date command, it is getting executed. Uh, guys, I have not got into anything on commands right now. Please uh, don't think that, okay, I've started with the commands. No, I'm just trying to make you explain that, okay, I'm executing some commands. So just try to understand now that there is a command by name date. If you execute this command, D-A-T-E, and say enter, it is showing you the current time and date. That is what I have to understand. That's all, not more than that. But we will have a separate, uh, uh, you know, like a discussion on commands only. So there I will more elaborate on these commands, okay? So right now I'm I'm just showing you, okay? Now when I'm executing a date command, it is getting executed actually. But as I said yesterday, that date command or ls command or any kind of commands we have, right? All those commands are not for the binary compiled programs. Already it's been compiled and kept sir, somewhere. I need to just call it. When I say ls and enter, somehow the command is getting executed, sir. When I execute a date command and execute, somehow it is getting executed. You have to understand in, the, in that way. Okay. So I, and also yesterday I said that whenever you are calling a command, you are actually communicating from the user to the kernel. Good. And whenever you're calling any command, that command is in turn calling a system call. And that system calls everything in the kernel space. Yes, sir. That is all. So it means that actually speaking, when you're, in, when you're calling a command, it internally invokes the system call. And the system call does all kind of a job. So system call is also one of the way where the communication can be made from the user to the kernel. Very good. Proc file system, IOCTLs, input output control operation, we say. This is not what your uh, devices, uh, you know, like IOCTLs, we say. Which we not to we need not to really, uh, you know, dig too in, too much into it. Sys file system and the proc file system. This is something very much interesting, and I will be discussing in uh, in uh, in uh, some time actually, not now. Okay. So if anybody asks you, hey, how to communicate uh, from user to the kernel, sir, there are five methods are there: system calls, commands, proc file system, IOCTL, sys file system. Okay. Uh, and also I have one more thing. Sorry, like I have missed it. Uh, there are six types are there. Now, just now I recalled it, uh, interrupts actually. Interrupts, uh, some of you might have heard about signals. Signals, interrupts and signals. This is the sixth method actually. Okay, through interrupts or signals also communication can be made from the user to the kernel. So Rajesh, do you have any other method apart from this? No, sir, you don't have any other method. Only these are the only six possible methods are there through which a communication happens from the user to the kernel. Okay. Okay, so this is how it means that these are the set of rules or the routines through which uh, the user can actually communicate with the operating system. You cannot simply do something nonsense. You cannot do uh, do something right. You need to follow. You there is a set of ways are there through which a communication usually happens, and because why why they have made this like this because your kernel is in a protected mode. You cannot just uh, tamper your kernel. Tamper means you cannot. Uh, you know, disturb your kernel. You cannot destroy your kernel. You cannot do any kind of a nonsense act to do to make your kernel fail. No, it is not possible. There are set of routines are there through which that only the communication can be made from the user to the application. So, Rajesh, uh, whatever you are saying from the user to the uh, to the kernel is is it for applicable to the application also? Yes, sir. It is applicable to the application also. Now, if you go to the here and if I do a double click on this Google Chrome, what you are doing? You are launching an application. You are running an application. So this application is in turn calling an API and that API is in turn calling a system call to communicate. So is there any other way? No, sir, there is no other way. These are the only ways. So these are the five or oh, sorry, six methods are there through which the communication can be made. Beautiful. So one of the way where we are communicating with the kernel is through commands. And to execute that command, we need a terminal and the terminal in turn will call, uh, uh, will, will have a shell also. So are you able to connect the dots, whatever I'm saying? Yes, sir. Good, very good. So if you have any doubts, please interrupt me. Okay, and in between, uh, I know uh, some things might not be clear at the first shot. You might have to, you know, like go through again and again. 
uh, and also in many documentation. Sir, I'm not saying from my own. I'm reading some documentation. I'm reading an article. I'm, I'm explaining all these things to you. So, but this is how it happens, actually. You take any bash shell scripting PDF. Okay. The first few chapters, no, in the first few chapters, they have discussed about all these things. They have discussed about the shell. They have discussed about the kernel. They have discussed about the user space, kernel space, how exactly the communication happened between the user and the kernel. So many things they have discussed elaborately. So, I mean, I will uh, give you a lot of PDFs and materials and, uh, uh, materials and the PDFs so that you can start reading it. Okay. So now, so as I said, guys, here what happened, right? You will get a you will get a terminal actually, and this terminal is not but the shell. So a question comes, uh, Rajesh, can I equate a terminal to a shell? Yes, sir. You can equate a terminal to a shell. Terminal is not but it's a shell prompt only, or it is a shell. And you will get when as soon as you log in, you will get this some kind of a prompt like this. This is nothing but we call it as a primary prompt. What do you call? We call it as a primary prompt. Because CentOS is a normal user, you could see at the end, you could see it's a dollar. Okay, Rajesh, it means, is, it, is it something like dollar? Uh, is something like it you will get for a normal user? Yes, sir. Dollar symbol will always get for the normal user. So let it be uh, Kiran, Rajesh, Mahesh, Suresh, uh, Vaibhav, anyone. Okay, anyone would be always, whenever a normal user logs in, he will get this, this uh, dollar actually. Whenever a user log in, he will get, sorry, whenever a root user log in, that prompt will be hash actually. You might have observed this actually. See, how to switch from a normal to the root user? I have to use su hyphen and say enter. Okay, I think uh, sudo su hyphen. See, can you see it? I have switched to the root user. See, for the root user, it is hash. Oh, it means that wherever you see the hash symbol, oh, you have to understand, oh, it's a root user. Super. Yes. Yes, sir. Sudo have you. Yes, sir. Correct. Uh, or else, sir, can you check it? Sudo su hyphen, if I give root, oh, it asks me for the password. Yes, I have to use sudo. Sudo su hyphen. Or I can say sudo hyphen su root also. Yes. Both are same. So what is this pseudo? Yes, pseudo hyphen I. Correct, sir. I'm going to discuss all this. Yeah. Pseudo hyphen I also you can use it. Yeah. So when I do a pseudo, uh, you assume what is pseudo, we'll discuss it after some time. Don't worry, but I, whenever I want to switch to the super user or the root user, you have to say pseudo su hyphen. Now a question to you that, uh, sir, who is a super user in Windows, sir? What is a, you know, like whenever you whenever you install an operating system, Whenever you install the Windows operating system, what is the default username? By default, it comes after installation of uh, Windows. Can you tell Admin. me? Admin. Yes. Admin. Yes. Very good. Administrator. Similarly, what happened, right? Earlier, uh, when it comes to Red Hat or Slackware or Debian or anything, right? Earlier, whenever you install any Linux operating system, by default, root was a user which was created. Root user is always part of operating system. in Unix or in Linux. Similarly, administrator user means you need not to create it separately. It comes by default with that operating system. So administrator user is user is part of Windows operating system. Correct? Do you agree with me? It means that after installing uh, Windows, you need not to create an administrator as a user. It comes by default. There has to be a minimum one user. And this administrator user or the root user, we call them as a super user or we call them as a system admin. Whatever you want to do, any operation onto the system, you can do via with the help of an administrator. Administrator or the root user, they will get a full access. You can do any kind of an operation, whatever is provided by your system or whatever it is provided by your operating system, you can, you can have a full access by logging to uh, by logging in with that particular user. So as you know that whenever I log in as an administrator, I'll get a full access. Means you can you can you know you can format any uh, drive, you can add any drive, you can partition, right? You can install any softwares, you can configure the driver uh, devices, right? You can even uh, you know create other user accounts. See, you are getting so many different uh, you know like permissions you are getting, whereas a normal user whenever he logs in, right? Uh, like Rajesh, Suresh. 
Mahesh or Kiran or CentOS or Ubuntu, they will have only limited access. They will not have all the access. Is it clear? So it means that if you check, usually what happened, the users, the users and the system users, or in a system or in a Linux system, users are broadly categorized into three categories. Into three categories. There are three types of users are there. What are those? First is the root user. Oh, he is a super user or super user, we say. Or we can call it as a system admin, but usually we call him as a super user. Second one is a normal user. We can even create a normal user. Like, for example, uh, like you can uh, create a normal user uh, like uh, Rajesh, Mahesh, whoever might be, Kiran. Uh, sorry, I'm always taking Kiran names, but I'll be taking other people names also. But these are all the normal users, we say. And the root user, you see that always, whenever he logs in, he will get the hash symbol. For the normal user like Rajesh, Mahesh, CentOS, Ubuntu, whatever, he'll get a dollar. And what is the third type of users? Is a system user, sir. System users. Later, I will show you what are the system users are there. There are a lot of systems users are there. Are there. Like, for example, uh, FTP user, mail user, okay, and uh, cups user. Many users are there like that, where these are all system users. It means that internally, the system or the operating system will use this user account. Clear? Anyone, if anybody asks you, can you able to tell this? Oh, there are three types of users out there. Correct? Now, what is a pseudo user? Why do we have a something? Is there any kind of a pseudo user? Is there a something pseudo uh, you know, permission to be? Yeah, there are many things are there which we are going to discuss later. Okay. Good. Now, coming back to this diagram. Okay. Now, oh, sorry. Now, so, so guys, now what happened, right? As I said, right, whenever a user logs in, he'll get a terminal. And that with, via with the help of the terminal, you are going to get even the shell also. Okay. Now, if you see it, okay, let me take one thing. Let me add one more. Let me open uh, one more image paint. Same thing, uh, the same diagram. Like I have this uh, RAM memory. Somebody might ask, uh, sir, uh, some doubt. Sir, I'm having 8 GB of RAM. 8 GB of RAM memory. Thus, this user space or the kernel space, uh, what is the size, sir? It will divide. How much size it takes, actually? So, usually, guys, uh, it depends upon the kernel to kernel. Because our Linux is a monolithic kernel, monolithic kernel, how they have uh, how they have configured is that, actually, when a system boots up, actually, okay, one by fourth of your RAM memory is taken care of by your kernel space. And three by fourth of your RAM memory is taken care by the user space. So Rajesh literally does something like two GB is something like a memory which is given for kernel space, and six GB is somewhat it is given for the user space. Yes, sir. This much is the memory it is given. Is a way I can display all this information. Is a way I can actually see and yes, you can do this, sir. But um, this is out of things which uh, I can't show you now because I have to write. Uh, there is a program is there which I have to run and show you that how I can display this user space and kernel space memories actually. Okay, but it is possible. Yes, it is possible. Hundred percent, it can be proved. What kind of a, in which ratio this memory is divided? Correct. Now, okay, it, does it happen in other kernels? You no, know, some micro kernels uh, they, they have one into one ratio. If uh, 16 GB RAM is there, 8 GB is for user space, 8 GB is for kernel space. What is the micro kernel? But then the question comes, uh, something comes to your mind, sir, is it this 2 GB is enough uh, for the kernel? Yes, sir, it is enough. It will work. The kernel needs very less memory because it is only executing some set of routines. That's all. It doesn't do any other thing. You are instructing to kernel to execute something, it, it does the job and it, it exits out. It does the job and it completes. It doesn't do any other work. But, but whereas in user space, you are doing so many operations, Hundreds of users are logged in. So many processes are running in a user space, right? It needs a lot of memory. That's what they have given more uh, uh, memory for the 
user space rather than the full kernel space. Kernel space is a very highly protected mode. It's a very small area where kernel is will be up and running. Right? So you understood, guys? Did you understood? Any doubts? No, sir. Good. Now, uh, yes. Now what happened, right? Again, the same story here. What happened, right? I as uh, a user logs into the system. Okay, like for example, in our case, CentOS or Ubuntu has logged in. Later, I'll create the user accounts and I will be able to log into that. Okay, Ubuntu user has logged in or CentOS user has logged in. As soon as he logged in, he will get a shell actually. And here it is a kernel. Kernel actually. This is a kernel. As soon as you log in, <coughs> sorry, he will get a he'll get a shell. Okay. So now, so let me draw a diagram. I will make it little down here. Okay. Now, so when a user has logged in, okay, CentOS user has logged in, he will get a shell like this. Yes. He get a shell like this. This is nothing but your shell. And what is the default shell he gets it? He will get a default shell by name bash. Bash is a default shell in Linux operating system. As soon as a user logs in, he will get a bash shell. So bash is a default shell in Linux. So whenever a user, whenever a user with uh, whenever user logs in into the system, he will get a default shell. Okay, and that is bash. So bash is nothing but the full form is uh, B O U R N. Bone B O U R N. B O U R N. Bone again shell. That is a full form of bash. Okay, now so bash shell you will get. Okay, bash shell is going to get. How you are going to display? Okay, uh, which shell you are working under? You have to go to this terminal, and uh, let me exit out from this root exit. Exit out from the root. So if you execute a command echo dollar capital S H E L L, can you see it is a bash shell? Slash bin slash. It means that right now. This CentOS user is actually sitting on the bash shell and working. So is it the same command I can use in Ubuntu? Yes, sir. Echo dollar shell. Clear? So what is this echo? What is the dollar? We'll discuss. Yeah, echo dollar zero is also correct. Yes. So so what I'll do, guys, uh, Ram Prasad, thank you. But what I'm trying to tell that, see, guys, in Linux, no, the beauty of Linux is that uh, there for displaying the same output, there could be a more than one command or there could be more than one way act. It is there. It's not like that only one method is there. For example, you want to do many operations, you want to do file operations. It's not like with only one command you can do a file operation. You can do, there are multiple commands are there, right? So it is always better that you should always have a knowledge of the multiple commands also or the multiple options. Always, but how we are going to learn at the very beginning is that actually we are going to only stick with only one command, so that people are comfortable with only one command. As you start, you know, working more and more in Linux, no, you will be exploring a lot of other commands are there which will give the similar output only, or which will give the same output. Then you might have a confusion, sir. Even that command is also giving the same output. This command is also giving the same output. Yes, both the commands will give the same output. How it is possible, sir? So what is what happening now, guys? When the Linux was evolved, right? When the Linux came into the picture, right? Earlier in 1991, 1992, there are a lot of commands were there, right? Which was carried forward for the traditional Unix. What are the traditional Unix we had now in 1975 or 78, right? Most of the commands they were took from the traditional Unix only. 
later as and when when things were getting highly progressive in linux many other people started contributing a lot of things in the command actually that's what you will see that there are multiple commands are there with which it will produce the same output so do I have to learn all the things yes it is better to have a knowledge i'm not saying that no it is always have a better to knowledge because in interview also you know it is very uh, you know strange that some people who are sitting in interview panel know they are very much eager to know that how much this person knows about the command so they will ask you about this command okay can you tell me about like how to display the ip address of the system sir i will say if config command okay rajesh do you have any other um, commands or other methods to display uh, no sir i don't know sir uh, okay fine so at least he knows one command okay so uh, suppose you will say that sir i want to uh, i want to go and uh, i want to uh, cut some kind of a string in a file i have a file and there are three lines are there sir i want to cut the you want to delete the first line of the file sir there is a cut command sir you can delete the first line of the file okay is there any method is there any way sir uh, yes sir, there is a set command is also there using set also i can delete the first line of the file okay is there any other way third method so he will not be satisfied at all he because that guy might be a very expert in linux he want to understand how much this person opposite person knows and if you are explaining so many things you are giving uh, you know lot of uh, if you are giving two three may ways okay this also can be achieved this also so he will get impressed with it oh he said okay this fellow knows many things because he has worked in a system you know very well actually so that's how uh, some people uh, you know be proved how much he know, knows about the linux it's with the concepts and with it and it with the help of a commands the any person can judge out your level of knowledge on linux clear so now okay uh, thank you ram prasad echo dollar zero also yeah you can display it actually yes dash so echo dollar zero this is in a zeroth positional parameter okay now you are saying something rajesh what is this parameter zeroth positional parameter will come across this later don't worry so this is a zeroth positional parameter through which uh, i am displaying which shell you are working at so it is always good some of you know many things so please keep uh, you know posting such things so that uh, you know like i can add on those things yes so now you get a default shell actually and that is a bash shell okay so rajesh whenever i am doing any kind of an operation i have to do via with the help of a shell without a shell you cannot do anything so let me write down some notes here guys shell is a sorry as soon as a user logs in he will get a shell you will get a default shell and in linux we get the bash shell we will get a bash shell okay bash shell is a default and echo dollar echo dollar capital s h e l somebody might ask me sir what is this capital s h e l l what is this dollar sir we will soon discuss don't worry so shell s h e l this is nothing but this is a one shell variable so whatever we are doing this shell right this is one of the shell variable we have to understand in this way okay as of now don't uh, name don't uh, really you know like don't really break your head much in this so just understand okay there is some variable with, with the name bash uh, sorry shell so he is trying to display the value whatever is there right with the help of echo command okay good or else you can even use echo dollar 0 yeah okay now so now so bash is a shell and without a bash you, any user cannot communicate with the kernel so shell is the interface between user and the kernel or you can say between the application and the kernel we learned already what is an operating system operating system is nothing but the, it is an interface between the user and the hardware oh whereas whereas with the shell or oh, shell is an interface between the user and the kernel okay without a shell the user cannot communicate at all uh, there has to be a shell without a shell a user cannot communicate with the kernel it is something like if i want to give an analogy guys uh it is something like shell acts as interface as i said now uh, assume that actually uh, you know like uh, some of you are very much interested you uh, know to get into very big company like microsoft company or 
like Jira company, Atlassian, ServiceNow company. There are many big jet companies are there, or Google company, right? You are very much willing or you are very much interested to you know join such companies, very big company, large companies. So now what you are going to do? Uh, means uh, you will go to the temple or you go to some uh, place where you start praying to the God. Hey God, please, please God, get me a job into a Microsoft company. It's such a big company I want to work. So do you think that when you're communicating and when you're speaking with a God, do you think that a God understands your language? No, God doesn't understand your language. God only understands the myth mythological language, that is Sanskrit language, right? You might be speaking in a local language like uh, Hindi, Kannada, Tamil, Telugu, or whichever language, right? Even though God understands every language, but I'm just saying that he understands the mythical, um, he understands only the Sanskrit language. So Sanskrit language through which he understands it. But you don't know Sanskrit language. How then how are you going to communicate with the God? So there is something by name priest or a pujari who will be there in each every temple, right? You will tell, hey, please ask God to get a job in a Microsoft company. So what that pujari will do, he will go inside and he will do something, num num num. He will say something and he will uh, and then he will communicate with the, your message to the God. And God is, and if God is happy with you, he might give a boon to you. Something, something like that. So shell is something like a pujari or the priest. Your karnal is like a God, actually. And uh, centaurs are all, he's a normal user. So whenever a normal user, he communicate, he want to communicate with the karnal, he cannot communicate at all. Right? Because your karnal is in a protect mode, he simply, the user cannot simply pass on some message to a current. It is not possible. You have to pass the message or you have to communicate with the current with the help of a shell only. And shell accepts uh, all these methods, whatever you decide, commands, system calls, proc file system, IOCTL, IOCTL, system, sys file system, interrupt signal, all these methods, the shell understands. That's how the shell can pass on that information from the user space to the kernel space. Is it clear, guys? Yes. Yes, clear, Rajesh. But yes, today, Aruna tried to learn uh, Sanskrit instead of Linux. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. It's clear. Good, sir. Good. Thank you. Uh, what about uh, uh, Mohammed Akhtar? Mohammed? Yes, yes, sir. It's clear, sir. But, sir, itnai, sorry, that's all, sir. No other thing. Itnai kafi hamarele. This much yes. is enough for us. I need not to learn anything, sir. Itna kafi hamarele. You have to understand all. I'm, I'm not explaining any more things apart from this one. Okay. Now, some people might be interested. Oh, my God, Rajesh. What is a shell man is all about? Okay. So, see, shell itself is a program. Okay. Shell itself is a program. Okay. So, what is shell made up of? Then, uh, shell is made up of, it is a, a combination of some libraries, some system calls, so some inbuilt function together, it is combined and it is created as a bash shell. Okay, fine. So Rajesh, during installation of the packages and everything, does bash is also getting installed during installation? Yes, sir, bash is also getting installed. Oh, oh it means that bash is a software? Yes, it is a software. Oh, okay. So, okay. So when I log into the system, how the bash is going to call? So when you log into the system, sir, the kernel or the operating system itself will create a shell for you. I said, ki hawa mein aa it doesn't come like that, right? When you log into the system, oh, it means that Rajesh, when I'm authenticating the system, when I give some user and the password, I will log into the system. Kernel itself will create a shell for you. Oh, beautiful. Okay, I got it now. So kernel itself. So it means that Rajesh is, is the shell is like a process which is running. Yes, sir. It's a process which is running. Okay. So how to display that process or how to check it out, the process. See, if you execute the PS command, can you see that there's a bash is running and it is a PID. So PS command, basically, it will display the processes. What are all the processes are there, which is running in your terminal? It will show you this process. And this is your terminal. And in your terminal, bash is a process which is running. So it is displaying this bash process. And every process in Linux or in Unix has something was a PID, process identification number, or process descriptor, we say. Every process will have some number, which, and this is the number. Right now, you have to understand only this much, not more. Don't understand anything more, okay? So it means that, so Rajesh, every process will have a PID. Yes, sir, every process will have a PID. Without a PID, the process cannot exist at all. So whenever 
a process is getting created in the system or into the Linux system, the kernel has to assign a PID for that process. So Rajesh, when you display, when you do like this, when you do a right click in your windows and when you go to the task manager in windows, and uh, here also you could see there are just so many processes are running. If this process are all are created by a kernel or the windows kernel, yes, sir, it is all. So, okay, fine. So these are processes which are running, okay. So some more details. See, sir, every process here also in Windows, you have something as a PID, okay? Process identification number. So why these PIDs are given, sir, by the system? What do you mean by PIDs? So these are the process IDs. Because your operating system or the kernel, it cannot understand the process name with the name. It can only understand the process with help of a process ID. So whenever your Windows is communicating with this Chrome EXE, it can communicate with this Chrome EXE with the help of a 12688. This is a number. You uh, Guys, you know that when you are in the school or the colleges, right? You go to the school, you will be enrolled to the school, and you will be given some roll number also. Even in your class also, in attendance, right? Uh, do you think that, oh, Rajesh, oh, Rajesh, uh, hi, Rajesh, Mahesh, you won't say roll number one, roll number two, uh, yes, sir, roll number three, yes, sir, you'll say, right? Because you're not identified by your name in your school or in the college. You're identified by your role number. Because uh, what happened, right? The names can be same, actually. Rajesh, Rajesh, you'll find hundreds of Rajesh. <laughs> right? So you cannot uh, represent uh, uh, the, the person's name with a name. You can identify with a unique number, actually. And that unique number, whatever in Linux uh, or in Windows, we call for each and every process, we call it as a PID, process identification number, or the process ID, we say. Oh, it means that Rajesh, there are hundreds of processes are getting created in the machine. Yes, sir. Hundreds of processes are getting created in Linux. Oh, it means that uh, during boot up time itself, the process will get created. Yes, sir. When the boot is, it means that when the operating system is loading into the memory, when you switch on the system, when you power on the system, the booting takes place. The compressed image of an operating system is loaded into your kernel space. That's what I said, right? During that time itself, most of the process will get created, sir. Okay. So what are all the processes, sir? Uh, sir, there are all are demon processes, some of the demon processes, okay? Sir, what is the first process which gets created in the Linux or the Unix? Yes, the first process is the init process, okay? Init is the first process which gets created. So guys, don't get worried that I'm tangentially going somewhere else here and there. Try to understand that, okay? Just because I will connect all these dots later. Init is the first process which gets created, which gets created. after the system comes up or after the kernel or system comes up. Yes, sir, process ID. Yes, correct. Oh, so in it is a process ID. This is a very, very simple common question. Somebody might ask you crazy person. Okay, what is the first process, man? What's the name of the first process which get created in Linux? So it's an init process. What is the PID of the init process, sir? So always the PID of the init process will always be one. The PID of init is always one. It means that the first process which is getting created in Linux is one. And that is not but init process. But some people, uh, you know, like, um, I don't want to give much more information, but okay, fine. But some people know when who are, are working on embedded level or system level, right? They will expect, uh, if you go to that internal, they'll expect something. So they'll say that, hey, what is the first process man, which is getting created in Linux? Ah, you'll say, sir, it is init process. Hey, do you know that before init process, some other process are getting created? Ah, sir, what is that process, man? Uh, sir, um, that is a dispatcher processor. Ah, dispatcher processor. So it is not init, right, which is getting created. It is a dispatcher process. Yes, sir, it's a dispatcher process. So does the dispatcher, dispatcher process will create a init process? Yes, sir, it will create init process. Oh, my God. It means that first some processes are getting created. After that, only init process is getting created. Oh, beautiful. So there are there are many hidden informations are there, guys, which, uh, you know, when you deeply dig into the operating system, you'll get to know. Otherwise, you know, everyone knows only the creamy layer, what is happening, right? So dispatcher was the first process which can get created. Then only it will invoke the init process. Then. And init process will, and init process will create so many demon processes. We will discuss in a separate pro uh, section where I'll be explaining about the process manager. What are the process management commands are there? Uh, like we have a command like a ps command, kill command, uh, nice command, re nice command. Okay, some kind of a commands which are related to scheduler commands. When you come over there, right? There we'll elaborate discuss about what is a demon process, what is a zombie process, right? 
when the process is stopped, when the process is uh, running, okay, when the process will go to an un uninterruptible sleep state, when the process will go to the interpretable sleep, uh, sleep state, and what is the demon process? So you have a different types of processes are there. We'll be discussing that in a exclusively, maybe by next week, we'll be going to discuss those things. And with a lot of commands and how I can use this concept in the scripting also, I'll explain you so that that will, uh, you know, that will be very good for you. So a lot of times, right, you, uh, you will be dealing with a lot of processes and you will be monitoring some processes also in the real time. And you will see what kind of a load which has gone to the process, how much load it is happening, how much is the free, uh, how much is our memory it is using, how much it has released. You know, you have to do a lot of monitoring also. So sometimes they might be, a, uh, they might ask you to automate some tasks so that you are monitoring the particular process. At the time, you should have a knowledge on all this. What is the process? What are the different types of process are there? What is this init process? Maybe you might have to know all this knowledge. Actually. Yes, yes, it's a name of a shell. Yes, it's a name of a shell. Correct, Priyanka. Guys, till here, any doubts you have? So I mixed many things. Okay, uh, I mean, for some people, it might be little confusion. Okay, because I'm going happy Saturday, but okay, fine. We have to understand few things. Okay, I will make it correct later. Don't worry. I will repeat all this again, again. At some context, you will see that oh, everything I'm coming into one single frame. I'll be bringing up so that you will understand everything. Yes, sir. No, sir. It's clear. It is going smooth. Okay. You can even Google it out. What is the dispatcher process and all? How the init process got created? Also, you can Google it out like that. Okay, you will get all information. Okay. Now, uh, yes, yeah. Coming back to here again. <clears throat> now, also when a user logs in, he will get a shell. Okay, a shell is made up of many things. Sir. Okay, shell is a default. Uh, sorry, bash is a default shell which. Uh, you know, like which uh, which gets allocated for every user. So does every user will have a bash? Yes, sir. So here what happened? CentOS has logged in. Similarly, when a Ubuntu user logs in or when uh, uh, Kiran or Ravi or anybody like uh, logs in, right? Or Pratap's logs in. I'll take a Pratap name. When a Pratap logs in. Pratap, your spelling is correct, right? Pratap? Yes, sir. <clears throat> yeah, it was correct. So Pratap will also get mm -hmm. a shell actually. And that also is a bash shell. That also is a bash. You will also get a shell like this. And this is nothing but your bash shell. Bash shell. Bash shell. So Rajesh, how many number of users are logged in or all the every individual will get a shell, sir. Yes, sir. The same shell will communicate with one single kernel like this. That's the reason what happened, right? Your kernel also supports multitasking because N number of users are logged in. It doesn't mean that all will keep it. All will be executing some process, right? So it has to do multitasking. So kernel understands each and every user request. Okay, CentOS user is communicating. Okay, it communicates with that particular shell. Okay, Pratap is communicating with me. Oh, it communicates. Oh, he's communicating with a particular shell. So kernel keep tracks of every user, even with the help of a shell also. And because this shell, how you, when you log into the shell or when you get the shell, this shell will also be, working under some terminal here also he will be working under some terminal and each and every terminal we have some terminal name slash dev slash ptest slash zero slash zero pratap shell is something slash dev slash tty1 so rajesh it means that whatever the terminal is saying does this kernel communicate with every user or every shell with the help of a terminal yes sir now in a very narrow way if you understand right so it is not like the bash are actually your kernel is actually communicating with that terminal only. This is the actual knowledge that you have to understand. It is actually doing all communication to the terminal only, nothing. So, but uh, how is this terminal getting? Eh, you are getting a terminal with the help of a bash on demand. So does a bash also has a terminal? Yes, it also has a terminal and that's a terminal name. So what is this terminal, sir? I mean, it is getting very confused for me. You have to just understand that terminal is something like, it is like a file. Oh man, you are saying something else now. It is a file. Yes, it's a file only. Okay. So if we, whether a user is actually communicating to the kernel with a file, yes, sir, it is coming with a file only. How is it? I will prove later. Are you finding interesting, sir? Oh man, it means that if a user is actually coming with the kernel with the help of a file, 
yes sir with the help of a file and but that is that file is not a simple file it is a device file slash dev slash pt0 slash dev slash dev slash zero. oh it means that does it is creating it is communicating with a file with a special category uh, category of file yes what is that category of file it is a character device file okay beautiful so rajesh that slash dev slash pt slash zero is it a character file yes it's a character file Slash dev slash ttv one is it a character file? Oh yes, it's a character. So what is the type of file, sir? Yeah, we will discuss it later. We have a different types of files. So one of the file is a character device file. Through that only you are doing a communication. Okay, beautiful. So does why I need all? This? Yes, sir. You need it because you will be using this slash dev slash ptv zero slash dev slash ttv one in your shell scripting. Because you are now communicating with the kernel with the with with the terminal. You will be doing. You will be doing some operation on to the terminal. You need. You will be using these terminals within your shell script also. Okay. So Rajesh, can I go here? Is a is it possible to display? It? Okay. If I execute the PTT, why? Okay. It will show me ls hyphen l. Uh, guys, don't worry. Some of you might know. I'm sorry. I'm introducing a lot of commands. But please understand with me. I'm just executing some command. Don't worry. We will come to these commands. So when I do ls hyphen l slash dev slash pts slash zero it is a character device file file command space slash dev slash pts slash zero it is a special character device file okay so it means that uh, rajesh how i can understand in a broader way if you are saying so when i log into it the shell creates okay the shell we get a shell okay does a shell holds the terminal yes sir it holds the terminal so it means that you are actually communicating with the shell but actually shell is through how you are actually communicating with the shell with the, via with the help of a terminal only because each and every terminal they uh, so each and every shell has assigned with a, some terminal name or with some terminal number so that only a user or the application is communicating with the kernel Beautiful. That's how you have to understand. Yes, very good, Ram Prasad. Everything is a Linux. I will come to this point later. Yes, everything in Linux is a file only. This is a beautiful answer which we give in a Linux. Everyone. So what is all Linux? Linux. Everything is a file only. You are communicating with a device through a file. You are communicating with the system or the kernel through a file, right? You can communicate with any kind of a process through a file. File is a base for everything. we don't have this concept of in windows actually windows file is not uh, not a method to communicate with everything you cannot communicate a device a device with a file in windows it is not possible there is separate routine is there to communicate with it but whereas in linux or unix you can communicate with a device with the help of a file only yes that is true so guys uh uh yeah any doubts you have i know for some of you it will be little tough or i mean it might be little confusing also but don't worry whatever we discuss okay this much is fine i will not be discussing any more thing on this because if i start discussing many things it might you know it might lead to a confusion state but this much is sufficient for us and this is a very very basic we have discussed not we have not discussed any high funda here clear any doubts you have okay Sir, anything you can unmute and you can say, sir. You can speak out. Sir, what about the RAM space that using by CentOS and Pratap, sir? User, two users are using a uh, hmm. same user space, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yes, sir. What sir. about yes. the RAM consumption? I mean, we can display, sir. We can write. Uh, we can show it how much is the space which is used by it, occupied by it. We have a command, sir. Who do that? I will show you how. How is it? Do you have an search? No, no, no. That is a. That is a. That is a command Excuse for. No, that is a command for uh, displaying the size of a file. Suppose you yes. want to display how much memory it is consuming. You can beautifully explain this concept in the Docker, sir. Actually, in the Docker also we can display it. Actually, some of you might know Docker. Actually, through a Docker you can actually sell that each and every container, right? How much space it is occupying. So there is something as a Docker stats option. Docker space stats is there, right? And specify the container ID. It will show you how much memory has been occupied for that particular container. Similarly, there is a command, and there is a even you can write a program to display that how much CentOS user is actually occupying the memory. What happened, right? This is uh, whatever we are using, no sir. Uh, 
Linux, what are you using now? These are all desktop operating system. Desktop operating system, right? It means that when a user logs in, uh, each and every user, right, what happened, right? There will be some set of uh, memory space provided for each and every user. It will be a constant, actually. It is not like that. It will be something like you in Linux if you log in, because this is the Ubuntu Linux or CentOS Linux, right? These are all desktop based operating system. When you log in, right? You you will say that okay, oh, sir, uh, give only uh, always give a 500 MB for that user, so that much is sufficient. Okay, CentOS login, he will give a 500 MB of memory space. User space will be given for the CentOS. Ubuntu login, he will be given 500. Okay, Rajesh login, he will be given 500. So there is a constant uh, memory space given for each and every user, irrespective whether he's using or not. But in a real time operating system, in the micro kernel, it is not like that. Every user it will be given a different different workspace. It will be given different different memory space or the user space will be given. Because to avoid uh, the memory, uh, to avoid any kind of a waste of the memory, right? Every user will be given a different, different uh, like memory, uh, right? Because there will be a crunch of the memory also in the, in the real time operating system. You understand? So, how we can display everything, we will come to that actually. Don't worry. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So, okay. Now, so now, so bash is a default shell which is using linux operating system okay so now so what bash does sir what are the bash does actually okay what bash does bash shell does now you know that see whenever i am executing a command suppose i go to this terminal i'll go to the terminal i'm executing some command date command so how what it is happening bash is actually allowing me to execute this command so bash will create an environment for execution of any command or application so whenever a user want to execute any command or the application your shell will provide an environment to execute it actually without a shell you cannot execute any command or application at all shell has to be there actually okay so now what happened right whenever you are executing any command what are the things where the shell does actually what shell does actually now suppose for example when i'm executing date command so date command will be <coughs> see guys now whenever i'm giving a date whenever a user want to execute whenever a user want to uh, give an input to the shell or i want to type something you know that you are using a keyboard you are using a keyboard right see if you understand a broader way like this this is your shell this is your bash shell correct so i want to execute some command right as a user you are sitting here outside So as a user, so here a user is sitting outside here, I mean, right? How will give, he will interact or he'll communicate with the cell by the, with the help of a input terminal, uh, with the help of a, he has to give some inputs. How we are going to give the inputs, sir? Uh, through the keyboard, sir. Keyboard is away, okay. Through a keyboard device, you are giving input to the bash shell. Now, what the shell will do? Shell will take that input, whatever a user is giving, it will process it, and it gives the output to a terminal. Sorry. It gives an output. It gives an output to the terminal. Or to your screen or monitor. Okay. So your keyboard will act like a input device. Your terminal screen or the monitor will act like an output device. Output device. So, okay, act as output. Sir, this terminal, whatever you are saying, the TTY command, sir, Whatever the command you are executing, TTY, it is displaying this. Is this is what you are saying, sir? Ah, yes, sir. What it is, sir? 
is the terminal is this oh, this is what it is sir okay this is what it is you are talking about terminal screen or the monitor see whenever whenever you are executing anything right see as a user i am executing dead command when i am executing dead command and say enter see you are getting an output here only you are not getting any output to somewhere else you are getting output to the terminal or the screen only where you can see the output so this is not but the output uh, so you are the output uh, you, you are getting through the output device and output device is but a terminal or screen only input device your input device is keyboard you are giving a keyboard so here what happened right this will this are not but this are not but the uh, what i said this are not but the uh, input device and output device you say and input device and output device everything right how it internally works means the shell will maintain some kind of a descriptors it maintains some kind of a descriptors like this the shell maintains some kind of descriptors the descriptors number starts from the value 0 up to 255 so descriptor number 0 will act like a input device input descriptor it means that whenever shell is receiving any kind of input from the keyboard oh it understands that the the values has to go to the descriptor zero and once it receives the value from the zero descriptor zero descriptor is not but it is a file descriptor to understand it is not but it is a channel it is a channel input device output device error de error output so this is not but the channel you have to understand so now shell takes the inputs like a user is giving an input something like a date command so you say rajesh how the date is inputting to the shell hey, through the descriptor zero man shell maintains a descriptors list of descriptors so what are those descriptors those are file descriptors okay beautiful some file descriptors are there so with the help of a descriptor zero okay with the help of a keyboard you are giving the input but the shell receives with the descriptor zero only this date command input it is getting from zero only okay fine and then the shell will do some processing and output will be given to the descriptor one and this descriptor one is actually attached to your terminal and your shell is actually redirecting the output of the uh, date command through this help of this descriptor one and this descriptor one is attached to this terminal that is slash dot slash pt uh, slash dot slash pt zero and then this output of the date command will be displayed into your screen or the monitor like that did you understood and you have something like descriptor 2 also. Suppose, for example, if there is any error, if there is any error is there. Suppose, for example, if I go here, if I, uh, instead of date command, if I if I do a data command and say enter, see, what shell is throwing? Shell is throwing an error. Now that data command not found, this is an error actually. And this error will also, will be given some processing. And if there is any error in the command or the output or the application, shell will always throw in an error to this descriptor 2 and this descriptor 2 is also mapped to the same terminal is it clear guys yes sir beautiful right now you understood something okay something we are going in detail in detail now finally okay so this much is really required for self scripting no sir it is not required not required at all but yes if you're going further, yeah, you need to analyze in a in a way in a in a way where you can understand how this exact system works actually. Clear, sir? So you might come across many. Sorry, your voice is breaking. Something. Yeah. Now, now, guys, now. No, no, it's clear, sir. It's cl now. It's clear for them. Okay. Okay. So uh, now you understood how no, things are falling, how these things are falling, and you can understand in a very, in a very uh, elaborate way. Oh, this is how it is happening. Things are happening. Fine. <laughs> okay, sir. Now, now what you are doing? Now one more step. We will go further, and we will stop it. So now what happened? That I am giving a input of date command. When I am into date command and giving an input, it is getting executed. Fine. Who is executing? Bash is executing. Yes, Bash is executing. And Bash itself, he is not executing, sir. It's a it's a kernel who is executing this date command. So here, what happened, right? If you see this diagram, now you have understood very well that you, here the CentOS user he is executing the date command, or oh, with the help of a keyboard, he is giving a date command input. Now this date command will be if it will be take will, you are giving to the shell. 
but the shell is not actually executing that. The shell is really thinking that, hey, kernel, you are the god. No, you please execute this dead command. So actually, the kernel is the one who is actually doing everything. So kernel is executing the dead command. And it is giving a output to the shell. And again, the shell is giving an output to your terminal where the term is where the value is getting displayed or where the output is getting displayed. And how this input uh, output, uh, Rajesh, you are saying so much input, output operation, so much, sir. How will all these things are happening? Oh, these are all happening with the help of a terminal only, sir. These are terminals. That's what I said that every operation, whatever you're doing, is through terminal only. There's no other way. And this terminal is attached to the shell. And the shell understands. How the shell understands that, okay, I have to give an input, I have to give an output, I have to give error. Oh, you are having something with a descriptor. Oh, something that descriptors are there. 0, 1, 2. So, Rajesh, there is a 255 descriptors are there. Yes, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 50. So, why we need so many descriptors? Yeah, we need it, sir, actually. Because what happened in a single terminal? In a single terminal. Suppose this is a terminal. This is a terminal. You know, you can, you can run hundreds of applications altogether. How your terminal supports hundreds of applications to run in a single terminal because with the help of this descriptor. Also, Rajesh, at a time, uh, a shell can actually run up to uh, something like nearly 2 to 50 applications. Yes, sir, it can run. It supports so many applications. Do one thing. Do one thing. You have this centaur. Sir, please launch one more terminal. I want to see. I'll go here. I'll do a duplicate decision. See, you're launching one more terminal. Now, Rajesh, I want to see what is the terminal name given to this now. Oh, this is one. Oh, it is slash dev slash pt one. Very good. Sir, launch one more, sir. One more same terminal. Now see the TTY, sir. See how beautiful it is that every login terminal is getting a different different terminal. You understood? Now, the question is uh, how many terminals are there? Sir? How many terminals you can launch in the Linux actually? So, you can launch up to 1024 terminals. But it is configurable. You can launch more than that. How many terminals? You can launch up to 1024 terminals can be launched actually. Sir, why is this bit uh, breaking, sir? Uh, what about others, guys? Guys? No. Yes, sir. No. Now, okay, 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 sir. Yeah, for me as well, sir. Oh, is it? Sorry, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, I mean, somewhere there's a T. -E For me also, Rajesh. Is it? Yeah. Now, sir? Yeah, yeah it's now, clear it's now. Better. now it's better. Now it's better. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Sir, did you understood this, whatever I said now? Any doubts you have, guys? See, I am whenever I'm, uh, whenever I'm launching any new terminals, I'm getting a new terminal name. Right. So if you go here, Ubuntu. So here, <laughs> slash slash pt zero. Duplicate. See, like that you will get terminal. Or oh, so now you can clear and say, okay, Rajesh. Whenever you are logged into a terminal, you will get a shell, and this is not for the shell. What you are getting prompt? This primary prompt where you see it is a shell only, and the shell is always attached to the terminal. Same part. At the end, you have to understand that. Right? Okay, so now come back here, come back here uh, to the notes. So shell will create an environment for execution of any command or application, right? Whenever you're exiting any command or the, or the application, shell will always create an environment. Okay, will always create an environment to execute it actually. Okay, so now, okay, okay. Sir, okay, fine, sir, I understood. Sir, uh, now you tell me a little bit in detail about how these commands are getting executed. How exactly the command get executed by the shell? Please explain, okay? So now, same thing, sir. I would uh, I would uh, use this, sim uh, I, was I, I would use this again, again for some time. Uh, later, I will stop using this user space, kernel space concept, but yeah. So this is user space. User mode, kernel mode. Okay. Here, CentOS user has logged in. Or whatever, Kiran or Mahesh, anyone. I mean, I'm just taking because we have the CentOS user, right? And this is here we have a kernel.
kernel okay okay now so centos user he got his own shell sir which is number the bastion bastion he got this bastion now what happened right centos what he will do that he will try to run a command with the help of terminal he is executing a date command right now what the bash will do as soon as he is giving an input of the date command to the bash bash has to understand what is this command and where this command comes from or where is this command so what the shell will do shell bash shell with the help of a path environment variable with the help of a path environment variable with the help of path environment variable shell will search for that command okay so uh, yeah could you please uh, mute yourself guys yes thank you yeah now whenever you execute any command the command will be given input uh, sorry the the bash shell will take this command first what it has to do know it has to check where this command is coming from or what is the path information of the command so in linux guys all the commands executable everything they are specified or they are kept in some particular path because all these are executable files you can you have to keep it in some path actually so with the help of a path in one variable shell will search for that command where that command is there okay so now for example if you go here into a terminal and if i execute a date command date command is getting executed but the shell has to first to find out or search right where that command is there so to search for the path uh, all the path commands or the com or the command uh, in which path it is present right so you have to say where is i think yesterday i executed this command where is space and specify the command name it will give you the path of that command oh the command date is there in slash usr bin path okay where is if config command it is there in the slash usr s bin if config where is free command it will give the free command is slash usr bin where is or there is one more command is which mount there is a command by name mount so you can use either which or you can use where is okay so it will give you the path information <coughs> information now so when you are saying where is date right what happened that right? the shell has to set where this command is placed or oh, this command is then slash user bin sir how it is going to search because shell has shown variable in one variable which is called the path variable so when i do a code or a path and say enter you could see that this is the path in one variable sir guys this is this concept is very 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 important for a devops engineer for anyone you have to understand this path in one variable so this path in one variable is one of the important shell variable which is used to display the path and what is this path this path will specify that what are all the commands you have in your system right where those commands are placed or in the, under which path the commands are placed so now when i do when i did when i executed a where is date command the date is then slash usr bin directory can you see, can you see the path somewhere uh, here it is there slash usr bin directory okay before so now what happened right now when i execute a date command enter what shell will do first shell has to search for this command path so with the help of this path n1 variable shell will search the command date whether the command date is then the slash usr local bin no slash usr bin yes this is the path where that command is there so now what the shell will do now beautiful now the with the help of a path n1 variable now the bash shell has identified that this command is there in the slash usr slash bin directory under this so what the bash will do that bash has to load this command it has to load this command into the memory it has to load the load load the command slash usr bin date command into the memory and execute it while executing what happens shell doesn't do execution at the time the control will go from your bash shell to the kernel uh, during the execution bash will not execute it bash do you think the bash will execute the date command no it doesn't do it it only knows that okay where is the path i have to load that memory i have to load that command into the memory 
once it loaded once it start getting executed then the control will go from user space to the kernel space the control the execution control will go from user space to kernel space now kernel start executing this command so rajesh for every application you are running an application the shell is loading that application into memory and when a shell is trying to execute then the control goes to the kernel yes sir then only it goes to the kernel so it means that rajesh the execution transfer will take from user space to kernel space the control will go flow yes sir so once the kernel completes again the execution transfer goes back from the kernel space to user space yeah it goes back either how it happens the shifting from the uh, how the shift happen the control of execution of from the user space to the kernel space and from the kernel space to the user space how it happens there is some special signals are there sir through that it communication happen oh man you are saying something extra now yes through a signal through an interrupt signal it happens what is that interrupt signal i don't want to uh, tip you int int 0 x80 this is one special signal sir through which uh, the shift of the execution from the user space to kernel space to the happen and also from the back okay man this is something new you are saying yes sir so person who is actually read the system level programming who is who has worked on a system level and the embedded level and only that person only can able to tell all this thing an application developer he will not know all these things at all he will never know what are this happening in the back end so you will ask the question rajesh did you worked in a system level programming earlier yes sir i worked on embedded level also earlier long back 10 years back uh, when i was in hp right uh, i worked with all these things actually because i was purely working on a hpx kernel level i learned all these things there only so any doubts you have guys no sir all clear Okay. Any? Uh, did you find interesting all these things? Understanding, learning. Sir, it's amazing, wonderful, interesting. Okay, it's good, sir. I mean, again, the question comes, sir. Do I have to really know all this? I mean, I'm to be very honest and to be very specific for a DevOps engineer, not required, sir. Not required, but yeah, the terminal, whatever, discuss descriptor, uh, term, and uh, uh, like this thing, these things and all are required. We have to know because we are using heavily all these things in scripting level. Okay, fine. <clears throat> Rajesh, why your sound was getting some echo? May I know only for me or someone else? Is it? Yeah. What about others? No, it is. No, it's clear. No, it's clear, clear for us. Okay, sir. Okay. So now uh, it is nine forty-seven. Uh, I will. We will stop it now. Okay. We will uh, join back again at ten forty-five. Okay, sir. Hmm? So let me stop this recording, sir. Uh, then we can discuss. Uh, we can. Uh... So I'm going to continue from here, sir. Okay. Don't worry. We'll continue from here, sir. So I'll stop it. Yeah. I'll stop the recording. <laughs>